Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, uh, I will be actually talking about the correspondence between ideals. So, before uh, actually getting into this uh, theorem, so let us recall what we have done uh, in the previous lectures okay? and then uh, I will tell about this correspondence between ideals. So, recall the isomorphism theorems that we proved. Okay? Suppose uh, we have a Lie algebra homomorphism from G1 to G2, call it phi. So, this is a Lie algebra homomorphism. So, then what we saw the very first uh, fundamental theorem of isomorphism tells us that uh, so if we take uh, G1 modulo the kernel of this phi1, so that should be isomorphic to the image of phi. Okay? So, the image of phi is a subalgebra of G2 sorry and then the kernel of phi1 is actually kernel of phi is actually an ideal inside G1. So, if we take this quotient algebra G1 modulo the kernel phi that will be isomorphic to image phi. So, what is the second isomorphism theorem says? So, this compares what will happen if we start with two ideals. So, let us say i n j r ideals in a Lie algebra G. So, then we can make this quotient i plus j modulo j. So, that should be isomorphic to i modulo i intersection j. Okay? So, there are many uh, inbuilt statements here i intersection j must be an ideal inside i. So, this right hand side quotient makes sense and j is an ideal inside i plus j. So, the left hand side quotient makes sense and these quotients are isomorphic. So, that is what second isomorphism theorem says. The third isomorphism theorem says if we do this quotient of quotient again we do not get anything new. So, we will again get something uh, quotient. Okay? So, what does it mean? Suppose uh, you have two ideals, okay, call it i and j, they are ideals inside g such that this i is contained in j. Okay. So, then what we can see this j mod i that must be ideal inside g mod i and if we take this quotient g mod i mod j mod i. So, this quotient algebra must be isomorphic to G mod J. Okay? It is kind of cancellation that happens. So, <clears throat> we also saw some uh, interesting example where we could use uh, this fundamental theorems. Okay? Uh, for example, we used it uh, for the adjoint map. So, when we use for the adjoint map which is a map from G to GLG. Okay, so, then the kernel of the adjoint map is nothing but the center of the G. Okay, so, this is the center, center of G. So, in particularly G modulo the center of G will be isomorphic to the image of this add map which is add G. Okay. So, this is uh, already a consequence of first isomorphism theorem. So, that means up to this uh, up to the center one can em embed this G model of center G inside the G L of G which is a general linear Lie algebra. So, now what we want to do we want to actually uh, try to understand uh, the correspondence between the ideals uh, from G to its quotient. Okay. So, for that uh, what we do we start with an ideal inside G. Okay. So, let me first state the theorem then it will become what I am talking about. So, so let uh, G be an G be a Lie algebra. And I is an ideal inside G. Okay? So, then what we can do we can talk about the quotient G mod I and then there is a natural surjective quotient map from G to 
g mod i so this is a quotient map which is surjective called quotient map okay this takes x2 x plus i so now what is the question so we want to understand the ideals of g okay that contains i okay so here is the set on the left side so you take the set of all ideals j of g such that j contains i. So, this is a one set on the left side. So, then what we want to do? So, we want to define a natural map to this set of all ideal set of all ideals of g that contains i to this set of all ideals of g mod i. Okay? The set of all ideals of g mod i. So, this is a natural map that is actually given by this pi. So, let us call this map f. So, what is f of j? So, f of j is defined to be so those x plus i where x is coming from j. Okay? So, in particularly using this uh, quotient notation, this is nothing but j mod i. So, this is the ideal. So, we already checked for given ideal j which contains i, the j mod i will be an ideal. Okay. So, this map is actually a well defined map that is easy to see. So, what we claim this is actually gives us a bijective correspondence between these two sets. So, f is a bijective correspondence. Okay. So, for that uh, we need to check few things, so, we need to prove that f is surjective as well as injective. So, let us uh, try to prove, so in a way we need to actually establish the inverse of f, so that is actually easy. So, we will actually define the inverse of s as follows, so if k is an ideal inside g mod i, so then we define uh, this f inverse of k to be the following uh, sub set inside g. So, what is this? You simply take f inverse of k to be pi inverse of k. So, what is the meaning of that? This is uh, those x in g that will be mapped under pi inside k. Okay? So, that means x plus i should be inside k. So, now what is there to check? Uh, we need to check this uh, pi inverse of k is an ideal. So, if we check pi inverse of k is ideal and then uh, if we prove that f of this pi inverse of k is uh, uh, k, so then that proves uh, this map f is actually surjective and we will also see uh, this actually k somewhat uniquely determines this pi inverse of k. Uh, so, that will actually tell you that the map f is uh, injective. Okay? So, let us verify. So, if you do not want this uh, notation maybe like we do not need to use. So, what I want to say my first climb uh, if I start with k which is an ideal inside g mod i, then if you take inverse of that ideal with respect to the quotient map, so that is an ideal inside g, so okay, that is the my first claim. So, it is clear that i is contained in pi inverse of k as 0 is in k. Okay. So, inverse of uh, pi inverse of 0 is nothing but i, so this i must be contained in pi inverse of k. So, if we prove that uh, pi inverse of k is an ideal inside g, so then this pi inverse of k will lie in the set on the left side. Okay? So, maybe let us label these sets. So, let us call this is uh, left hand side set L1 and this is uh, the right hand side or the L2 maybe. <coughs> so, now what is our claim? Our claim is this uh, pi inverse of k lies inside L1. So, for that we need to prove pi inverse of k is an ideal. 
So, let us check that. So, to check pi inverse of k is an ideal, let x in g and then y is in pi inverse of k. So, then what we need to prove? We need to prove that the bracket x y must be in. So, we need to prove bracket x y is in pi inverse of k. So, but note that if we take x plus i and then y plus i, so this must be in k as k being ideal inside g mod i. Okay. So, that tells this bracket x y plus i must be inside k. So, that will imply the bracket x y is inside pi inverse of k. Okay. So, that is the definition of pi inverse of k. So, that way you get this and this is true for all x in g and y in pi inverse of k. So, we proved pi inverse of k is an indeed ideal inside g okay. and as 0 is in k, i is already contained in pi inverse of k. So, that proves pi inverse of k is an i is inside your L1. Okay. And now, if we compute what is this f of pi inverse of k, so what is the definition of f of j if you recall. So, f of j is nothing but j modulo i. Okay. So, that is those uh, x plus i such that x is coming from j. So, then you can easily see that by definition this f of pi inverse of k is nothing but those x plus i in g mod i such that x is coming from pi inverse of k. So, since it is just uh, it is x is coming from pi inverse of k using the definition of pi inverse of k you can see that this is nothing but just k. Okay. So, that proves that f is surjective because given each k we have uh, the inverse which is pi inverse of k. So, this is verified. Now, let us see why f is injective. So, this is uh, we verify now f is injective. So, let us take j mod i okay, because anything will look like j mod i. Uh, so, now if j mod i is actually j 1 mod i is same as j 2 mod i for some ideals j 1, j 2 coming from this L 1. Then what are all the properties? So, the properties are j 1, j 2 are both are ideal in G and both contains I. So, this is the property. Okay. Now, using this property we, we prove that this j 1 must be equal to j 2. Okay. So, for that uh, we just prove one containment. Okay. If we prove j 1 is contained in j 2 with a similar argument you can see that j 2 must be contained in j 1. So, that will imply j 1 equal to j 2. So, let us verify this. For verifying this start with some x in j 1. So, if we start x in j 1, so then it is clear that x plus i will be inside j 2 modulo i as j 2 modulo i is same as j 1 modulo i. So, that will imply x plus i will be equal to some x dash plus i for some x dash coming from j 2. So, now this means x minus x dash which will be in i which will be contained in j 2. So, that will imply that x will be inside j 2. So, we started with x in j 1. So, and we proved that x is in j 2. Okay. So, that proves that j 1 is contained in j 2. So, using similar argument we can prove that j 2 is contained in j 1. So, that will say j 1 must be equal to j 2. Okay. So, this proves that the map that f we have defined is actually a bijective.
So, this is indeed a very nice correspondence because uh, in case if we know some information about uh, the quotient, okay, for example, the quotient is an abelian, uh, abelian Lie algebra, then we know that uh, any subspace will be actually a ideal inside the abelian Lie algebra. So, that means we will be able to uh, get uh, lots and lots of ideals that containing it. So, this kind of information uh, will be repeatedly used later. Okay. So, one should actually understand this correspondence very well. Okay. So, for example, uh, in our next class, uh, we will be actually classifying all uh, Lie algebra of small dimension. So, maybe we can uh, try to do up to dimension 3. Okay. So, uh, in that classification, uh, we will be using all these uh, results. Okay. So, one should be very comfortable with uh, uh, the results that we have proved so far. Okay, so, this is actually kind of uh, ends the correspondence between ideals. So, now uh, what I want to do, I want to introduce a new way to get uh, Lie algebras from old algebras. So, this is again like a very important question, so, okay, how to get okay, given Lie algebra, how to get given let us say Lie algebras, then how to get new Lie algebras from the uh, old Lie algebras. That is an important question. So, here is a very important construction called direct sum. Okay. So, let me just uh, define. So, before actually uh, defining uh, what is direct sum of Lie algebra, I would like to recall what that means in linear algebra. Okay. So, because these uh, characterizations uh, will be very, very helpful. So, let us uh, uh, recall some results in Lie algebras about direct sum and direct product. Okay. So, here is the definition and uh, some of the characterization of direct sum okay, of vector spaces. So, we talk about two different uh, notions, one is uh, internal direct sum, another one is external direct sum. Sometimes for the external direct sum, we just call it a direct product. Okay, uh, but these words are in some sense interchangeable because up to isomorphism there are all uh, unique. Okay, so but anyway, let's first recall this direct product, which is external. So that is something uh, easy to understand. So let's say we are given k number of vector spaces. Okay, so these are all vector spaces over C. So, then what is the external direct sum or the direct product? So, you take the Cartesian product of these vector spaces. Okay. So, each element of this Cartesian product will be a tuple k tuple of this uh, x1 etc xk where each xi will come from Va okay, for all I, I from 1 to k. So, now this v 1 cross etcetera v k this can be made into a vector space by defining. So, if you take x bar inside this v 1 cross etcetera v k and then uh, y bar inside this. So, x bar you write it as x 1 etcetera x k and y bar you write it as y 1 etcetera y k. So, then you define x bar plus y bar as a component wise addition x 1 plus x 2 sorry x 1 plus y 1 etcetera x k plus y k. Okay. So, on how the scalar multiplication is defined given complex number the alpha x bar is defined to be again component wise scalar multiplication alpha x 1 times etcetera alpha x k. Okay. So, this way you can make this uh, the Cartesian product into a vector space and this is uh, called like external di direct product. So, now 
uh, one important thing observations so which will be very important uh, in order to make what is internal direction. So, you can see that the dimension of uh, this product is nothing but the dimension the addition of the dimension ok. The dimension of v 1 cross etcetera v k is just a sum of the dimension and not only that if I take any vector v from this v 1 cross etcetera v k. So, you will be you are able to write this v as uh, vectors of the form v 1 plus etcetera v k where v i is nothing but 0 etcetera x i 0. So, where this x i is coming from this ith component ok. So, what does it mean? So, given any x any v from this uh, product there exist unique set of v i's such that this happens ok. And where this v i's are coming from these v i's are actually coming from this ith component ok. So, maybe like uh, we can say uh, we can identify v i with capital v i with this subspace which is given by this ith coordinate ok. So, then if you identify then we can say that these v i's indeed coming from this capital V i ok. So, basically any v can be written as sum of this v 1 etcetera v k in a unique way. So, that is what important. So, this uh, observation actually can be used uh, to define what is called this uh, internal direct sum ok. So, internal direct sum is about a given vector space. So, let us say v is a vector space which is given and then v 1 etcetera v k they are all subspaces of v ok. And then we want to understand when this v is actually kind of isomorphic to v 1 cross etcetera v k. So, for that uh, we have the following uh, definitions ok. So, the following or equivalent. So, this is I am not going to prove I if you have not seen the proof you should uh, go back to your linear algebra. Uh, book and then see proof of this ok. It is a very very important uh, result about direct sums. So, you start with this uh, v you want to say this uh, v is isomorphic to v 1 e cross etcetera v k if and only if this v can be written as sum of this v k and each vector v of v can be uniquely written as. So, uniquely written as sum of these vectors v 1 plus etcetera plus v k where this v i will come from v i for each i ok. So, this is a some most of the books actually will give this as definition of direct sum. So, v is just a sum of this v 1 etcetera v k and each vector you can write it as unique combination of v 1 etcetera v 1 plus etcetera v k where v a comes from a. So, some books say this is the definition of direct sum ok. But equivalently what one can say so, here is the third definition you can write v as v 1 plus etcetera v k and suppose if you write 0 as v 1 plus etcetera v k for some v i is coming from v i. So, then we must to have
v i is 0 for each i. Okay. So, this is another characterization. So, so this following condition should satisfy v must be v 1 plus etcetera v k and the following condition should satisfy whenever you write 0 as uh, v 1 plus etcetera v k uh, for some v i in capital v i then we should have v i equal to 0. Okay. So, the fourth definition so this again can be rewritten as follows v is nothing but v 1 plus etcetera v k and whenever you take intersection of v i with uh, this other sum of v j's where j range from 1 to k and j is not equal to i if you take intersection with this sum of these uh, other things then you should get 0 and this should be true for all i. Okay. So, this is uh, another characterization. And again this can be relaxed a bit if you follow some order. So, first you are taking v 1 and then you are taking direct sum with v 2 and so on. So, then you can see that. So, this is uh, equivalent to you write v as v 1 plus etcetera v k and now instead of taking uh, v i intersection with all the sums you can only take only take uh, intersection with uh, sum of v j where j range from 1 to i minus 1. Okay. If this intersection is 0 for each i 2 to k then again this v will be isomorphic to direct sum of v 1 etcetera v k. So, note that in this case all these cases the dimension of v will be sum of the dimension okay, dimension v 1 plus etcetera plus dimension v k. So, indeed one can use uh, the dimension uh, uh, and then give another equivalence okay, let me call it uh, 6 dash. So, here I am not going to just say uh, whether this v 1 plus etcetera v k is full or not, but uh, v 1 plus etcetera v k makes sense at, and it is a subspace. So, as long as the dimension of this v 1 plus etcetera plus v k is equal to the dimension of v 1 plus etcetera plus dimension of v k, then we can guarantee that this subspace v 1 plus etcetera v k will be isomorphic to v 1 direct sum etcetera direct sum v k. Okay. So, this is also another characterization. So, again you can also have characterization using basis for example, you can one of the advantage of having uh, this uh, direct sum you can start with the basis of v 1 and then basis of b 2 and so on basis of b k you can put them together that means, you can take the disjoint union of that and then make basis of basis of v. Okay. So, this is another characterization which I am not writing, but anyway you can easily see this will give you another characterization in terms of basis. Okay. So, why I was actually recalling all this uh, because I wanted to define what is called this uh, uh, direct sum of uh, Lie algebras and we will also see later uh, something uh, important about this semi simple Lie algebras. So, one of the important result about the structure theory of semi simple Lie algebras says that any semi simple Lie algebra we are talking about finite dimensional semi simple Lie algebras. So, that will be direct sum of what is called simple Lie algebras. Okay. So, that will be proved later in this course. So, now what we will do we just uh, define what is called this uh, direct sum of Lie algebras. Okay. And this is again naturally motivated let us say we are given k number of uh, Lie algebras or complex numbers. So, then what is the direct sum? So, direct sum again you take, take it to be as a vector space the direct sum is nothing but the Cartesian product where x i is coming from g i for each i 
and whenever you given this 2 x bar y bar in this uh, direct sum, the Lie product is defined to be the component wise Lie product. So, this is just bracket x 1 comma y 1 etcetera x k comma y k. So, what is this x bar? x bar is x 1 etcetera x k and then this y bar is y 1 etcetera y k. Okay. So, given this, this is how you define Lie product. Okay. I will leave it to you to check this actually defines uh, Lie algebra structure on this uh, Cartesian product which we will call direct sum of Lie algebras. Okay. So, we will not use uh, any other notation whenever we say direct sum of Lie algebras we just mean that and of course, one can talk about internal direct sum of uh, Lie algebras we will see like up to isom of sum it will be clear what we are talking about. Okay. So, before actually moving further let me first define uh, what is called the simple Lie algebras. So, this is actually a perfect time to define. So, what is simple Lie algebra or complex numbers. Okay. So, it is a Lie algebra. So, that is uh, actually contains uh, no non-trivial ideals. Okay. Just to avoid uh, these trivial examples, so we will also make this assumption that that Lie algebra has dimension at least 2. Okay. So, a Lie algebra G over C is said to be simple <coughs> if the very first condition we say that dimension g is is greater than 1 with respect to complex numbers. The second thing is if i is an ideal inside g then we should get either i is 0 or full. Okay. So, that means g contains no ideals other than 0 and itself. Okay. So, this is uh, the, the definition of Lie algebra. So, once we have defined uh, the definition then I can make uh, the following proportion. Okay. So, this actually talks about uh, the direct sum of uh, the simple Lie algebras. So, let us say we have k number of simple Lie algebras. So, then <coughs> we can form what is called this direct sum. So, then you can actually make the following uh, statements. So, first of all these g i's okay, those things will be ideals inside g. Okay, these are all called simple ideals okay. and uh, if we take any other simple ideal if i is a simple ideal in g then we should have i equal to g i. So, it is actually identified i equal to g i for some. And the third thing if we take any ideal inside g then this i must be sum of sorry <coughs> sum of some g i's. Okay. So, this is the statement. So, this is actually tells about once we take direct sum of the simple Lie algebras what are all the ideals that this direct sum can have. Okay. So, here this g i we identify with uh, this the ith coordinate. So, those x in x i etcetera 0 where x i coming from g i. So, this is this ith coordinate. 
okay so so let me actually prove this it's just a very simple proof so you uh, so what is the proof so first to note that because uh, gi is simple so we have the bracket gi gi is equal to gi and the center of gi is is zero okay so now let i being ideal inside g so then what happens i will contain the bracket ig okay by definition but what will be the bracket ig so that will be just uh, sum of i range from 1 to k bracket ig so we have already seen that if you start with two ideals uh, i and j then the bracket ij must be an ideal inside g so i will leave it to you to check uh, gi must be ideal inside uh, g so that is simple verification so this i will leave it uh, you to check okay now if i is actually contains all this sum of bracket i g i then what you can say about this bracket i g i so this bracket i g i since g i is an ideal so this also must be contained in uh, g i so now this bracket i g i is also ideal inside g i so this put together gives either this bracket g i is zero or the bracket g i must be equal to g i so now what you do you take this capital a to be those i from 1 to k such that this bracket i g i is non zero so that implies the bracket the bracket of i g i is becomes g i so that implies i must be containing uh this sum of bracket i g i where i is coming from capital a but if you think about this is just nothing but sum of g i i coming from capital a okay but the thing is why this capital a is non empty so a is non empty since the center of g will be nothing but center of g1 plus etc plus center of gk all of them are zero so this is also zero okay so because i cannot be contained in center of g so that will imply uh this center of uh, sorry this a is non empty so that means so you get i uh that is contained in sorry this i contains this summation gi i range from capital a and a is also non empty now if you actually think about it so one can prove okay this i must be equal to this summation gi i in a okay so let us see so because what we have achieved okay we have achieved that if you look at this i intersection gi okay so what will happen to this so this is going to be again ideal inside gi so that will tell this i intersection gi will be either zero or full so that means whenever uh, this uh, uh, gi that you take that has some non trivial intersection with i so that must be contained in gi so i will leave it as exercise okay uh, to prove that using this i actually must be equal to gi i in a okay so that actually proves the third statement 
that any ideal i in g must be sum of some this g i's and now if i is simple ideal then it is clear that because this g i's they commute with each other and then g i in some sense lie in this ith coordinate. So, then i cannot have two ideals inside uh, uh, i. So, then that will force that i must be equal to g i. Okay. So, this proportion tells us uh, complete uh, in some sense complete uh, information about uh, this direct sum in terms of the simple Li algebra g i okay, or the simple ideal g i. So, this will be used later in the structure theory of semi simple Li algebra. So, that is why I just recalled here. Okay. So, with this I will stop now and then we will continue again in the next class with the classification of smaller dimensional Li algebras. Okay, thanks.